It was an age that began with a bold declaration. It was an age that inspired generations, transformed culture, technology, and set up new industrial revolution. Now, flash forward to today. Some say our best days are over, and we can't do great things in space anymore. Houston now controlling the flight of Atlantis. The space shuttle spreads its wings one final time for the start of a sentimental journey into history. The U.S. scrapped its shuttle program and now wants the private sector to come up with ways to get astronauts to space. For the first time in 50 years, America is not the leader in spaceflight. After we stopped going to the moon, it all ended. We stopped dreaming. But most people don't know that we're on the verge of the next great space age. Are you ready for what's next? We now have the ability to create a future where people live, work, and create in space. By applying common sense, basic business thinking, and living off the land, we will enter a new and exciting era of space exploration. And now we can do it for less than we are spending on our space program today. Let me show you an example of how this is possible. For the first 100 miles or so into space, commercial U.S. rocket companies carry astronauts and crew back and forth to wherever they need to go. This saves money and creates a new U.S. space transportation industry. We don't need new, expensive, single-purpose rockets. We just need more flights of smaller rockets that we already have. Commercial trucks, trains, and ships, just like a commercial rocket, are designed for the short haul. Bigger trips to space need more launches, not bigger launches. Just like on Earth, customers don't care how big and shiny your truck is as long as your cargo gets from point A to point B safely, they're happy, period. This saves the U.S. taxpayer money by lowering the cost from Earth to low Earth orbit by a factor of five. Between Earth and the Moon is a stable point called L1, where the Earth's gravity and the Moon's gravity cancel out. Here is where we put a gas station and a research facility. This is where we continue to learn to live and work in space. Over time, L1 will grow and become one of our key hubs in space where we will connect flights from Earth to the Moon, Mars, and asteroids. Now we can land on the Moon with reusable, multi-purpose commercial landers. First, robots land, then crews land to begin harvesting lunar ice and making rocket fuel. Operated by people on Earth 24 hours a day, the Moon crew is there to keep the robots running and harvesting ice, turning it into rocket fuel. Using the landers now filled with propellant, our crews fly back to L1, filling the tanks with rocket fuel. Each flight from the Moon adds to the reserves, which results in lowering the amount of fuel we have to carry all the way from Earth. This makes each flight cheaper. The L1 station not only becomes a gas station in space, but also a research facility where we begin to learn how to keep crews healthy for longer and longer stays in space, which is something we'll need to know as we go further and further into space. Using spaceships that never return to Earth, astronaut crews travel back and forth between L1 and LEO, carrying fuel to grow our reserves at each location. Now this process allows us all to travel to and from other places around as well. For instance, asteroids. This allows NASA to gather critical scientific data and also scouts for other potential useful resources, such as rare Earth metals like gold and platinum. Now in the 60s, each trip to the surface of the Moon cost about 32 billion each on average, or the cost of 19 shuttle flights. Using this new system, a mission to the Moon costs only 2.7 billion per year, or 1.7 shuttle flights. Here's another comparison. The cost of the entire shuttle program was $209 billion, and that only got us to lower Earth orbit. Using this new system, the cost of permanent lunar settlement, including initial propellant production, would cost 90 billion. That's less than half. At this point, we will have the skills and technologies for the trip everyone's been waiting for, Mars. But we're not directly going to the Martian surface. First, we do the same thing we did on the Moon and at L1. We create an offshore gas station. We have capsules going back and forth between Mars, Moon, and L1 and telerobotic rovers making Martian rocket fuel. This means that we don't have to carry the fuel that's necessary for the return trip or even for the rides down to the surface of Mars. All we need is enough fuel to get to the Martian moon. We'll collect whatever we need after we get there. From the Mars moon, astronauts are able to control robots on Mars. These robots explore, gather, and return samples and prepare the right site for the first human landing. Now on Mars, the same thing is happening. Landers are going back and forth between the moon and the surface, and rovers are going back and forth between the Mars factory and Martian ice, thus making rocket fuel. Now, the first human landing on Mars can take place, with the habitat and fuel for their return trip already waiting for them. Supported by Mars Moon and knowing safety is only a few miles overhead, 
our first humans can begin exploring Mars and telling us back on Earth what it's like. They can send back samples, conduct research, and build settlements. And this is all while making rocket fuel at the same time. So how much does this cost, and how long will it take? Well, with this plan, getting to Mars will cost $192 billion, and it'll take 20 to 25 years to finish, which averages about $12 billion a year. This is well under the current NASA budget, which is currently standing at $17 billion per year. Some of you may be thinking right now, why haven't we started this yet? Where are we now compared to this plan? Well, we're just now beginning this process with the emerging partnership between the commercial space industry and NASA, and we'll need to continue this trend if we're gonna make this a reality. As President Kennedy said, we do these things not because they are easy. Well, you know the rest. We will only be able to do this if we change the way we think about what we want to do in space and how we want to do it. To afford to explore, America can't do things the old way. It's a new age. If we put our heads together, new thinking and new space can lead to a new frontier. Now, let's go make it happen.